40 minutes or so, let me present to you how we at Emory and the American Diabetes Association have put together uh, some guidelines for how to manage patients in, with COVID in the hospital setting. Uh, 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 this slide was taken yesterday from the task force, from the Hopkins task force. And it's amazing that in four or five months, we now have over 7 million people with COVID. And in the United States, up to yesterday, we already passed the 2 million uh, infected persons with 115,000 deaths just in this country. And if you look at the daily confirmed cases and how they've been moving, of course, we achieve a plateau, but we have not really seen much of a reduction in the number of cases in different countries are doing much, much better than we are in the United States. And here you have in green the United States versus the other countries, uh, United Kingdom, Germany, a significant smaller number of cases. And it was kind of depressing last night when the national forecast will update that they were going to have a couple 200,000 deaths by September, according to the Harvard School of Medicine. So definitive, the epidemic have not, have not really gone away. So what have we learned? So when you go to PubMed, and this, I did this last night, 680 publication has been uh, put in the literature in PubMed. So a tremendous amount of manuscripts, most of them are low quality, and unfortunately, all of them, or most of them, are just observational studies and review papers. But what we learn is that COVID affects more, and there's a gender differences with male having more cases than females. And perhaps the most important is uh, age. And here you have 80% of the cases with COVID occurs below the age of 65. Unfortunately, mortality, 80% are those with over the age of 65 or 70. And in addition to age and race, perhaps very uh, concerning is the increased rate and increased fatality in minority populations. And what you're seeing here is to your left, those non-hospitalized in the middle in orange is non-fatal hospitalized patients. And to the right hand, known to have died. And there's no question that both African-Americans and Hispanic Latinos have significant higher rate of hospitalization and higher rate of mortality compared to Caucasians. And Asian have less than all the other three races. So it's interesting how this pandemic is affecting different racial groups. So I divided these presentations in different questions. And the first question is, is the prevalence of diabetes in hospitalized COVID patients is different from a known COVID patients? And here you have three studies from China and you have the rate of diabetes is somewhere around 10 to 20%. So if you look at the previous paper published in the United States, the rate of diabetes in hospitalized patients is about 20 to 30%. So it appears that COVID in the rate of diabetes in hospitalized patients with COVID appears to be similar to other sick populations around the world. And these are several references from our group that have shown that about 20 to 30% of patients in the hospital have diabetes. The other point that has been very clearly demonstrated in a large number of observational studies is diabetes is a significant risk factor for mortality in hospitalized patients with COVID. Here is the data from one of the first reviews from China. And what you see in here is in the middle non-survivors and to the right, survivors. And what I want to show us is that among patients with diabetes, the rate of non-survivors was 31%, was more than double the rate of diabetes in the survivors. 
meaning that diabetes increase mortality by twofold. And if you have patients with severe COVID admitted with respiratory failure, this is a series of patients from China, the patients that were admitted requiring ICU admission who have low oxygen concentrations or ventilatory support. And if you look at this group here in the middle is patient with diabetes and to the right, non-diabetes. And I want you to focus the, the, your attention to the bottom of this slide. Patient with diabetes were more likely to require RCU admission, like 66 versus 40 percent. More likely to require ventilatory support, double, 81 percent versus 49 percent. And if you have a patient with respiratory failure or need to be incubate, intubated, with diabetes mortality was greater than 80 percent, compared to less than 50 percent for patients with non-diabetes. So there is no question that diabetes is a significant risk factor. These are data mainly from other countries. What about in the United States? A paper from Bruce Bode in the Journal of Diabetes Science Technologies that is impressed, he collected information in 1,100 patients from 88 hospitals around the country. And he cleared patients who have diabetes and out control hyperglycemia greater than 180. And those patients with diabetes of uncontrolled hyperglycemia, mortality was 29% compared to 6.2% those who do not have hyperglycemia or diabetes. So there's a three to four fold increase in mortality. And what is interesting is that hyperglycemia in patients with and without diabetes increase the chances of mortality. In the bottom of this slide, you see that 48% of patients who did not have a history of diabetes but presented with hyperglycemia die, compared to 15% of patients with non-diabetes and normal glycemia. And with Francisco Pascal and David Klonov, we're collecting this data in a large number of patients with COVID to look at the impact of hyperglycemia on our comp. And for those patients who have a glucose greater than 250, mortality was significantly higher, both in non-ICU here to your left or in the ICU to the right. So these slides will indicate, or this work from Bruce and ours indicate that in the United States it's the same message. Hyperglycemia is important for as a prognostic uh, uh, as a factor. We don't know if it's hyperglycemia or the glucose per se, or is hyperglycemia a marker of poor outcome. So there are several mechanisms for increased risk uh, uh, mortality and complications in patients with diabetes. First, diabetes and obesity are chronic inflammatory states, and diabetes has been shown, especially with poorly controlled, to decrease the immune or impair the immune system, increasing the susceptibility for infections and disease progression. There is also evidence that the virus has been found in the beta cell in the pancreas. So it may produce a decreased insulin secretion in these patients, accelerating the appearance of poorly control. The third is the use of steroids, that in many protocols they're using COVID, especially in the inflammatory state, and as we know, 80% of patients with diabetes who are treated with steroids develop hyperglycemia greater than 200 in the hospital setting. Even in patients with no diabetes who are sick, who are treated with steroids, about 40% develop a glucose greater than 200. So steroids have an important, uh, may have an important impact both in the appearance of, in, of, 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 of hyperglycemia and perhaps on the rate of complications. The other thing that has been of great interest is, is reading the, some papers suggesting that ACE inhibitors or ARBs and the use of DPP4 may increase the risk of progression. First, the ACE2 is a co-receptor that may allow cell entry, and that's what has been implicated that the use of ACE inhibitors may increase the risk of infections and outcomes. But there's a couple of papers right now, for example, this one published in April last month, and what you have is that in 1,100 patients in China, those taking ACE inhibitors have lower 
upper mortality that those patients not taking AR, 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 ACE inhibitor of ARVs. So the mortality was even lower by 70% in those patients that were treated with ACE inhibitors of ARVs compared that do not. So the idea that ACE inhibitors are bad may not be that, that will not be correct. What about DPP-4 inhibitors? Again, people have in, implicated that the DPP-4 is a receptor that may allow to enter, this, uh, the, uh, enter the virus in the host cells. And there's some data from animals that is not very clear to me, but there's a meta-analysis and a couple of papers that have shown that the use of DPP-4 is safe and is not associated with poor, uh, poor, poor outcome. This has allowed the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and the American Diabetes Association to put this kind of comment. First, we do not endorse cessation of ACE inhibitors or ARVs or DPP-4, and there is no good data suggesting that if you use ACE inhibitor of ARVs, the patient is going to go, uh, have more complications. Even if you stop it, there is an increased risk of complications. So what do we know about management? We really don't, we don't have any prospective randomized control studies related to glycemic control. There are several submissions to the NIH that have been under review. But so far, what we learned is, of course, we need to use personal protective equipment and I'm not going to tell you because you, a healthcare provider, have been very well informed about that. The recommendations, and this is coming in a paper published by the Francisco Pascal and his group at Emory, the recommendation is measure hemoglobin A1C in these patients, just to know if the patient has his, with hyperglycemia, just to know if the patient had a history of diabetes or a stress hyperglycemia. Second target, the recommendation of the American Diabetes Association is to maintain blood glucose between 140 to 180. There is no need to type control less than 100, less than 90 milligrams. Just keep the glucose in the mid 100 would be enough for most people. Insulin, hypoglycemia has to be there, and the use of non-insulin agents has also been implicated. Let me let me review a, a couple of indications. First, what do we do if the patient is admitted to the ICU? We have, the, we have always said that critically ill patients in the ICU needs to be treated with IV insulin infusion. In, because you can adjust rapidly, you can adjust insulin dose, you can titrate, you can stop if the glucose is, is, is low. But during the COVID patients, the use of IV continuous insulin infusion has been reconsidered because it mandates to have glucose measured every hour would expose the nursing staff and increase the use of PPEs. So in the ICU, similar to the non-ICU, we have been using subcutaneous insulin for most patients. If somebody is completely unstable, insulin infusion is indicated Otherwise, sub-Q insulin is the way to go. And again, you don't need to have tight control. You just want to have the blood glucose in the 100 range, less than 180. So the best way and the, 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 the regimen that I prefer is to use what is called the basal plus approach. Basal plus approach comes from a series of papers from our group that shown that a single dose of basal, let's say this could be glargine, deramir, deglutin, once a day basal insulin, it started at the dose of 0.2 to 0.25 units per kilo, plus correction with sliding scale insulin if the blood glucose greater than 140 or 180 is enough to control most patients. And the classic approach to use basal bolus means that you give a, single, a dose of basal plus prandial insulin plus correction. It may be indicated for all patients with type 1 diabetes or for those patients with type 2 who fail or the basal plus approach. And these data come from a study that is called basal plus protocol that a single dose of basal insulin, 0.25 units per kilo, so somebody like me, somewhere around 20 units, 
plus correction with rapid active insulin before meals, compared to basal bolus regimens of four injections a day, resulted in similar blood glucose concentrations and similar blood glucose before meals and at bedtime. And this is a paper on 370 patients that shows that the basal plus approach is okay, both for medicine and for surgical patients. However, we don't have prospective data on COVID patients. Then the other thing is about uh, glargin. Can we use the new insulin or more concentrated insulin? This is a paper published last month or this month in Diabetes Care. And what you have is comparing glargin U300 with glargin U100, you get the same glucose control. So if you're going to use the ultra long insulin like Degludec or glargin, you use the same dose, 0.25 units of basal plus corrections. And if you compare the glargin U300, this to 100 is about the same glucose control, but the same like has been reported in ambulatory studies, the glargin U300 is associated with some, sig some significant reduction in the rate of clinical significant hypoglycemia with a glucose less than 54. Our group and other have studied the role of DPP4 in patients to manage patients with hyperglycemia in the hospital. There is a lot of, there's about 800 patients that have been treated in the literature. Then just going to mention one study that is called the CETA Hospital Trial, published by Francisco Pascal in Diabetes Obesity Metabolism a couple of years ago. And we took patients with blood glucose between 140 to 400, they were treated with diet, oral agents, or total daily dose of insulin less than 0.6 units per kilo. And they were randomized to a DPP-4 on one dose of clartin or the basal bolus regimen approach. Both groups received correction doses. And here you have the mean daily blood glucose if you treat the patient with CETA plus one dose of basal versus basal bolus mean daily blood glucose throughout different days in the hospital to the left, or the mean blood glucose before meals and at bedtime to the right. So why does it work? Because DPP-4 work especially on postprandial glucose, and the prandial dose of insulin works on postprandial. So the administration of a single dose of basal plus a clargin or deramir should be enough. And this is a paper coming out in endocrine practice next month. And what you see here in 680 patients, if you use basal bolus with basal or DPP-4 or DPP-4 with basal, it should be okay for most people. So no need to use basal bolus in most of these patients. And the current diabetes report in last year, we published that we recommend that for mild hyperglycemia or frail patients, those patients that are not treated with insulin prior to admission can be managed with a DPP-4 or with basal plus approach. Those patients who have moderate hyperglycemia, as an alternative to basal bolus therapy, you can use DPP-4 with basal. So let's say you start somebody on 0.25 units per kilo. The way to increase the dose is that you increase by 10, 20% every day. And if you are not achieved control, you can add a DPP-4. And for those patients with mild hyperglycemia, you can add a DPP-4. And if you don't achieve control, you add a low dose basal insulin. And this combination is as good as you have basal bolus approach that we used in the past. And what we want to use is less intensified therapy to prevent hypoglycemia and more importantly, the utilization of PPEs and exposure of nursing staff to the patient. One word about what to do when the patient goes home, is ready to go home. So we have been using insulin at discharge, but in a paper that we published now several years ago, and we have learned this, and now that we're using CGM in the hospital, we see the large number of patients who develop hypoglycemia. If you send patients with glargin alone or basal bolus, the rate of hypoglycemia in this study was somewhere around 30 to 40 percent. So hypoglycemia is very common. And the problem with that study is that 
we used the uh, insulin when the hemoglobin A1C was between seven to nine percent. And I think this is a mistake. I believe that we shouldn't use, if you have somebody who has not been on insulin prior to admission, in the hospital you treat them with basal plus or basal bolus. When the patient go home, just restart the oral agents. And if the hemoglobin A1C is less than eight, bingo, you stay there. If the patient has a hemoglobin A8 to 10, then restart the oral agents and give half of the insulin that you use in the hospital. Let's say the patient is taking metformin, DPP4 at home. You restart those agents and you give half of the insulin, the, the basal insulin, so the glargin, the deromir, degludec that you were using in the hospital. And only leave a basal bolus for a patient who have type 1 diabetes, patient who were in basal bolus prior to admission, and maybe patients who have a hemoglobin A1C greater than 10%. Because the use of the uh, discharge also, the combination of agents like shown in this paper shows that it works very well avoiding the use of insulin. Another area of great interest in the last few, few months has been the large number of patients or the increased number of patients that are admitted with diabetic ketoacidosis. About 7% of patients with diabetes who present with COVID infection are on diabetic ketoacidosis. So treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis traditional has been with insulin, but that requires insulin adjustment every hour and blood glucose monitoring every hour. For the first 12 to 24 hours until resolution of GKA, that requires tremendous amount of exposure to the nursing staff and the use of PPEs. So many, many studies around the country now are reactivating these old protocols that we did several years ago using sub-Q insulin. And here you have protocols that we can give rapid active insulin, so Lispro, aspartic, glulysine every hour or every two hours. Compared to IV insulin, you see that the utilization in these of 0.2 units every two hours, 0.2 units. So somebody like me, 14 units every two hours. And when the blood glucose is less than 250, you decrease by half every two hours. And the resolution of diabetic ketoacidosis, glucose, bicarbonate, you know, pH, beta hydroxy, beta ray free fatty acids was similar to given IV insulin infusion. There are several protocols that are available in the literature, especially that I'll show you in a minute, where you can get those protocols. So the final point that has been of great interest is the, the use of continuous glucose monitoring instead of pricking fingers every hour or before meal several times a day. So there have been several papers in the non-ICU showing a very good correlation between blood glucose by point of care testing and CGM with more than 90% accuracy in between point of care testing and basal insulin. In a paper that is, uh, just, was just accepted for publication in diabetes care, here you have that the use of Freestyle Libre CGM correlates fairly well with point of care testing. But more importantly, what we reported in this study is that you do finger sticks usually before meals and at bedtime, so the patient had no glucose monitoring between 9, 10 p.m. until 6, 7 a.m. And what CGM does is recognize a significant number of hypoglycemia, especially nocturnal hypoglycemia. Even what we call prolonged hypoglycemia, blood glucose less than 70, more than two hours. So we're using now the uh, CGM, we have used Libre, we have used the Descom. And what we now have to report is what is called the hospital glucose profile. Well, you see that a patient is admitted during the first day, the second day, and then the third day, people goes under control. And we, with this, we're now getting this information from the CGM, but we get the average blood glucose, if they have been low blood sugars, in target range of 70 to 180 or high blood glucose. We can also look at glycemic variability and the time of range. So, where are we? How can we implement all of these changes? <clears throat> and I want to invite all of you to a website and hopefully you can write down 
or or um, this this website www.covidindiabetes.org with Francisco Pasquela and the co collaborators at Emory and around the world are helping us to ma navigate diabetes during the time of COVID. So uh, they have divided this. They have a web. They have an app. They have a webinar. Then trying to put together how you can help with response, the recovery, surveillance, and how to prepare in the future. So for example, in this website, you get different protocol for treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis. Here is the one to the left, is what we have published in the past, the sub-Q insulin. Here is the, the group at Montefiore in New York. They have great experience with TKA. They have published their protocol and here to the right is the protocol that they are using in the United Kingdom. So this type of protocol are there in this website. So you don't have to invent your own. You can review what is being published and then modify it according to your institution. We also, uh, there is a website for, for glucose monitoring. How you should the Dexcom G6 or the Libre you know, the good, the bad limitation of each one of them, how are you going to implement this in the hospital setting? And here in this website, you can go and download and review, for example, the G6 use the clarity, and you know, and, 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 and then you can, it can help you to set it up in the hospital setting. And, and, there's also some other protocols that you can download, not only for DKA or management, but for example, how do you, add, what protocol has been reported with the use for steroids, for example, or the IV insulin in the ICU, you have here the Montefiore, here in the bottom is the yellow protocol, and use of corticosteroids also with Spain, they have been very active in reporting their own protocol. So I really believe that, that these websites can help you to download important information that you can use in today-to-day -to -day practice. So what, in summary, what I've been trying, uh, how can I summarize this presentation? So there is no question that there is a high prevalence of diabetes in COVID patients and everybody admitted to the hospital. Diabetes is a significant risk factor for complications, they have higher hospital admission, they have higher use of ICUs, ventilatory support, and mortality. Patients with have significant COVID infection with pulmonary complications and diabetes, the mortality has been greater than 50%. And if you're admitted to the ICU, mortality can achieve 75, 80% of patients. So you need to treat it. And there is good evidence that hyperglycemia, both in patients with and without diabetes, is associated with poor outcome. So how do you manage these patients? First, just keep the glucose less than 180. There is absolutely no need for intensified glycemic control, 80 to 120. Just keep the glucose between 80 to less than 180 to be enough. Not everybody needs insulin. Those patients with mild hyperglycemia, they are stable, maybe oral agents, metformin, DPP-4 should be okay. Metformin has the problem that if the patient becomes hypoxic or acute kidney injury that is seen in about 30, 40% of patients, can be a problem. But you can use the DPP-4 for mild hyperglycemia. And if not enough, you can add basal insulin. I do believe that in patients with diabetes treated with oral agents prior to admission, the best protocol is the basal plus. Give a single dose of basal insulin. And that's enough for most patients and you do correction or you add a DPP-4 to avoid the basal bolus regimen. But if patients have type one, very severe hyperglycemia, or if the patient had been treated with basal bolus prior to admission, maybe the basal bolus would be indicated. And of course, in the ICU, we have always said continuous insulin infusion. We're now reducing the use of continuous insulin infusion and trying to use sub-Q insulin in these people. We're working with the manufacturers of these CGM devices in submitting protocols to the FDA 
for evaluation of the use of CGM in the hospital setting. This epidemic of COVID, with the aim to reduce PPE use, exposure to the nurses to frequent glucose monitoring, the continuous glucose monitoring has been implemented at different sites. And again, COVID in diabetes that or, or, or that come is a good good uh, sorry uh, COVID in diabetes .org is a good website that I invite you to go and visit where you can download recommendations on how to treat these patients. They are presentations like this one who will be added to, to this website. And you can get downloads, you can get a recent reprints, PDF or different papers. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention.